Good morning. A question that we all ask at some point, is fear a negative force in my life? As a believer, as a Christ follower, is my fear doing me damage? Or is it just inevitable? Does it, does it do me harm? Or is my fear that I carry through life, is it unavoidable? Some of us worry about money, a position, employment, health, the safety of our grown kids, the well-being of our toddlers. Some of us worry about relationships or future marriage. For some of us, it's just, just this impending doom that looms over us, like a dark cloud, like a, like a rainy day. The Bible asks one question over and over again about our fear. It's, it's a re recurring theme, and so it's good for us to look at, and maybe for me to ask myself, for you to ask yourself. Throughout the Bible, it focuses, focuses on this one theme, this one question. It goes like this. Whom do you fear more, man or God? Do, do you fear society and culture and, and, and man and this world and all that it has to offer because it is a scary place or do you fear God whom do you fear more now a good question that you might ask me would be well how do you even how do you fear man what does that even look like and so I've I've got three ways in which we sometimes struggle in our fear of man our fear of others our fear of this world number one <clears throat> when I think a lot about people's opinion of me. And at every turn, I'm fearful regarding what someone might actually think about me or what I do, what I say, who I am. <clears throat> Second way in which we fear man. I live in fear of danger. Money danger, health dangers, and I, I fear the world and its ability to hurt me, and I don't fully embrace God's control over my life. So I, I worry about how much damage the world can do to me, my family, my future, my health, wealth, and my mental state. And I, and I, and I, and I don't major on fully embrace God's ability to control all of that. Third way in which I fear man. Number one is I think way too much about what about people's opinion of me. Number two, I, I fear uh, the danger that they could bring my way. And number three, I live my life according to the world's standards, their system, their way of doing life rather than God's. There's this incriminating passage in the Old Testament which says that the nation of Israel honored God to an extent um, that's often referred to as fearing the Lord. Uh, they, they did that. They, they feared the Lord. But at a deeper level, the nation of Israel, they worried about what others thought about them. They feared the world more than they feared the Lord. They're, they're the friends and the surrounding nations and, the cult and culture as a whole. They, they feared God, but, but they feared the world more. Join me in 2 Kings 17. It says, So they feared the Lord, but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from whom they had been carried away. And then it says, Even to this day, they do according to the, the former manner. They do not fear the Lord, and they do not follow the, the statutes or the rules or the law or the commandment that the Lord commanded the children of Jacob whom he named Israel, the Lord made a covenant with them and commanded them. You shall not fear other gods or bow yourselves to them or serve them or sacrifice to them. Isn't it interesting how the Lord uses the word fear to mean when we bow the knee to someone else or when we serve or sacrifice or worship something else. It's like we fear them. Verse 36 but you shall fear the Lord. Don't, don't fear these other lesser gods, but fear the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt with great power, with an outstretched arm. 
However, they would not listen, but they did according to their former manner. Verse 41, so these nations feared the Lord and also served their carved images, the stuff they made with their own hands. Their children did likewise, and their children's children, as their fathers did, so they do to this day. This is an indictment on the nation of Israel. It says that, yeah, they feared the Lord, meaning they, they honored him and worshiped him and revered him, but they feared the world more. You see what that does to the credibility, the name and honor and fame and reputation of the Lord, who, who we say we follow, whom we say we follow. Um, perhaps this passage and what's said of the nation of Israel could be said of us as well, that we fear God, but we fear the world even more. Can you relate to that sort of thinking? Um, I mean, what someone might do to me or, 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 or what certain loss I might, uh, I, I might feel, the, the, the loss of my job, the loss of my health, what somebody might do to me. Like I, I, that's what really, that's what I'm really afraid of. Fear feels so familiar at some point in life, doesn't it? Like, like it's just become a part of me. Like, it's become a, just a natural part of life. Like, it's just what we do. Look at everybody. Everybody, everybody's afraid. You see it all over social media and the news, and just in 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 the social in, in social settings, everyone is afraid. Is it is it normal? Is it meant to be normal? Maybe for you, maybe you can relate to that, that way of thinking, but, but on the other hand, maybe for you it goes something like this. Like, fear is something that must continue to live in me until I get my life's details worked out. In other words, like, I've got all these things that are going wrong in my life, and so I'm afraid, but fear will no longer rule the day once I work out all the details of my life. Now, I made a pretty big statement when I preached on fear a couple of weeks ago. This is part two, by the way. Welcome. Um, I made a pretty big statement last uh, two weeks ago. I said, your fear is not usually caused by your circumstances. And your fear won't usually be cured by the bettering of your circumstances. Why? Because fear is irrational. And it's good for us to admit that. Fear is irrational. You might ask for biblical evidence that, that fear is irrational. And I would, I would say, well, we studied the life of King Saul two weeks ago. And he is, he is example or exhibit A regarding how fear is irrational. Remember, he was Israel's first king. He was God's chosen man. In this supernatural event, God said, reach down and said, this is my man for the job. King Saul, he, it says that he was the most handsome man in all of Israel. It says that he was head and shoulders taller than everyone else that lived in Israel. It says that he came from a family of wealth and privilege. And yet, fear ruled his heart throughout his life till the day he died. You might remember his first act as king, he goes missing. Why? Because he's so afraid that he goes hiding behind the luggage. And they're looking, where's our new king? Where's our new king? And they can't find him because he's hiding in the luggage. I want to tell you one more story just to freshen your memory, because it's been two weeks since we talked about this. Freshen your memory, memory regarding the, the level of fear under which King Saul lived. First Samuel 15, remember Samuel was the prophet who anointed King Saul said, you're God's man. You are our first king. Samuel, the prophet, did that. And so now Samuel is just so heartbroken over the fact that King Saul has not been a good king. He has led in fear and he has not, he's not honored the Lord in his, in his reign. And so verse 17, it says, and Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, King Saul, are you not the leader of the tribe of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission, told you to go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they were all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? Okay, now what he's talking about. What's he talking about? What he's talking about is, there's one point in the story where he says, 
Well, if you obey the Lord, why do I hear the bleeding of lambs and sheep? In other words, I still hear the, 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 uh, the, the, the voices uh, of the, the, the animals that are alive, and you were supposed to decimate that camp. You were supposed to kill all of their cattle, but you kept it for yourself. You didn't obey the Lord. And Saul's response, uh, he does what we do often. Uh, he justifies his fear. He, he says, no, 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 I, I obey the Lord. Uh, I, 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 here's my justification for not doing exactly what the Lord said. He says, I kept some of the best sheep and some of the best cattle. Yeah, I did that. But it's because I'm, I'm going to sacrifice it to the Lord. I'm merely keeping the choice animals, the best animals, so that I could sacrifice them to the Lord at a later date. He doesn't yet own up to the fact that it was fear that drove him. And then Samuel, you know, he, he, he tells him, listen, you may have heard this famous quote before. He says, listen. What do you think the Lord values more? Your, your monetary sacrifice, like all the stuff you do, or your obedience? He says the Lord values obedience over sacrifice. We fall in the same trap. We live in fear. We don't honor the Lord with our lives. We say, oh, but I do. I go to church. You know, I give some money. I, I, I do so much for the Lord. I, I, I sacrifice for the Lord. And, and he wants our hearts. So, so finally, Saul admits to Samuel that he had sinned. But, but look at the, the origin or the, the, this, the, 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 the cause of his sin. He says, yes, Samuel admitted to, uh, to, or Saul admitted to Samuel. This is verse 24. Saul admitted, admitted to Samuel, yes, I, I have sinned. I have disobeyed your instructions, disobeyed the Lord's command. And then here's what he says. For I was afraid of the people, and I did what they demanded. And Samuel receives that answer as honest because he knows that's true. It was King Saul's fear of his own people that caused him to be disobedient in how he went about with the battle. There's no room for fear in the life of a believer. Time and time again in Scripture, we see that there is no room. In other words, God won't work in tandem with your fear to accomplish great things in your life. He won't do that. He calls us out of fear. Fear is such the opposite of who God wants to be in our lives that, that he wants to root out that fear and exchange it for courage that he might work powerfully in our lives. I'll say it again. Your fear is not usually caused by your circumstances and won't usually be cured by the bettering of your circumstances. King Saul had every reason in the world to be a man of courage, and yet he was a man of fear. It wasn't his circumstances. It was his heart. Today we read of uh, the second king of the nation of Israel, King David, and he was a man of courage. Let's look at the contrast between the two kings. Um, the life of King David. Well, he was a shepherd boy. Um, 1 Samuel 16, um, Samuel is looking for the next king, the second king. God told him, I'm going to show you who the next king is. 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab, um, and he thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by appearance or height. And we, we learned that lesson with Saul. Uh, For I have rejected this man, Eliab. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Skipping down to verse 10. So, so Samuel is looking at all these brothers, uh, trying to figure out which, because the Lord has led him to this house. And he's looking at all these brothers. Eliab's not the one. God just told me, what about these other brothers? In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied. But he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down and eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. 
and he came, he was dark, he's handsome with beautiful eyes, and the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. He's not like the rest. His name was David. And so Samuel did what, what, what God said, he anointed David as king on that day, and the lesson here is that my fearful view of circumstances, often not reality, Samuel looked at the, the circumstances. He said, it must be one of these brothers. It must be, it's none of these brothers. Who is it? And God says, I don't see things the way you see things. I don't view people the way you view people. You look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. And so the first picture that we have of David in battle is that of a courageous warrior. It's the most famous story. You probably heard it in Sunday school when you were a little boy, a little girl. It's David and Goliath. You remember that. David's a young uh, shepherd boy, never been in a battle before, but he is offended. He is offended by the offensive speech that this, that this Goliath, this, this giant, is spewing, this hate speech that, that uh, Goliath is spewing in the direction of, of God, in the direction of the nation of Israel. And so David, verse, uh, chapter, uh, first Samuel 17, uh, verse 45, David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, the Lord of, the heaven, of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I'll give the dead bodies of your men to the birds, wild animals. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord res rescues his people but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Amen. David's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defeat you today, but it's not because I am mighty in battle. It is because the Lord is mighty in battle. So while it is accurate, normal to say that we all struggle with fear, it's also correct to say that fear has no place in the life of the believer. Because when I don't have Randy confidence, what I'm called to is God confidence. I was asked a good question uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I said, Pastor Randy, aren't there times when fear makes sense? I mean, there are times when we should be afraid. And I'll give you an example. Like, well, I am afraid of venomous snakes. I mean, and I should be, right? I should be afraid of venomous snakes. But, but that's not what we mean by fear in today's topic, in today's study. I mean, it's an educated respect for the deadly venom um, in, the, in, the rattle, in the rattlesnake that causes you to run, causes you to be fear. That's an educated respect for the facts. Don't play with snakes. That would be foolish. However, there's a different kind of fear that runs deep in our souls. It is lacking in God confidence. It's a, it's, it's a deep-seated fear that I, I'm going to be poor if I'm generous or I'm going to be taken advantage of if I am gentle toward others. A fear that says, I will be ridiculed, made fun of, if I take a stand for Christ. That's the kind of fear that we're talking about. That says, uh, God tells me it's going to be okay, and the world tells me it's all going to be, become unraveled. And I believe the world, not God. God says it's going to be okay. The world says that, that my life's going to be a wreck. I'm going to believe the world, not God. So I fear what I shouldn't fear. And I don't fear what I should fear. In other words, I fear the world, which I needn't fear. And I don't fear God, whom, I, whom, whom I'm called to fear. There, there, is no, there is no place for fear in the life of the believer. King David went on to be a man after God's own heart. And if you know his life, you know that he had uh, much distress in the leading of a divided kingdom. 
He had a great deal that he could have been afraid of. Danger was lurking around the corner at every stage in King David's life. His friends would often turn out to be his enemies. People would pursue him to kill him, cause him danger when he had done nothing to them. But, but in contrast to Saul, David had a, had a handle on fear. He was, he was able to overcome. On numerous occasions, he was chased by men who without cause were his enemies, and he was able to overcome his fear and be a man of courage on his deathbed. His final words, his dying words. 2 Samuel chapter 23 reads like this. These are, the, these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, speaks. David, the man who raises up so high. David, the man anointed by the God of Jacob. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words upon my tongue. These are the dying words of a man who realizes I've written many of the songs that people use in worship. Even to this day, he wrote the book of Psalms. Many of the Psalms. This is a man who says, I, the Lord has anointed me to, to lead people in worship. I've led a nation in, in military victories, but I've also led a nation in the worship of our great and mighty God. And He's got all this God confidence as he lays in his bed about to die. Because King David, all of his life, he delighted in the Lord. And in contrast, King Saul, all of his life, wallowed in his private fear. Do you recall the last, the dying words of King Saul? His, his dying words were this. I am so afraid. I'm so afraid of my enemies I will just take my own life. Again, it is, it is not your circumstances, but it is your heart that is mostly driving your fear. So let's talk about, for just a few minutes now, how do I overcome my fear? I don't want to live like that anymore. I want to be a man of courage. I want to be a woman of courage. I want to be a teenager of courage. How do I overcome my fear? That's what we'll talk about now. I want to spend uh, more time right now in this application section on some topics that I, that I briefly touched on two weeks ago in part one of this, this sermon. Um, uh, we, we have a diagram. It, it should be on the screen now. It's a, it's, we'll put it, up, put it on the screen in a second, but it's a, it's a diagram of with three quadrants. Uh, and, and I think if we are going to be a people, if I'm going to be a person who, who overcomes my fear or, or, or trades in my fear for, for the courage that the Lord wants to give me, I'm going to have to live my life in these three quadrants. I'll give them to you one at a time. I think we see these being key differences between King Saul and King David throughout their lives. Um, if I want to trade in my fear and become a man of courage, number one, I'm going to admit that fear is doing me harm. Fear is doing me harm. It's, it's irrational. It's unhealthy. Uh, it needn't to be coddled and cared for, which, which we all do at times. We nurture and care our, for our fear as though it's somehow good for us. And we're, we're going to have to, if we're going to overcome it, we're going to have to admit, my fear is doing me harm. It's irrational. Statistics say that almost everything we fear never even materializes. Now, now, some of you have had terrible things happen to you. You were on the wrong side of this statistic. Like perhaps something you feared really, really did come true. And I, I, I understand that. And I, 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 feel, I, I feel that weight. And, and, and so I, I, I think the, the second quadrant, we'll get there in just a second, is, is where I want you to land quickly. But, but, but for most of us, for a high, high percentage of us, all the fear that we've amassed throughout our lives has, has done us no good, it led nowhere, and it never even materialized. So this first step is, I want to admit, this is irrational. I, I, I want to get rid of this. 
This is doing me no good. This is harming me. The second quadrant in which I think we're going to have to live and exist, spend some time on, is I want to create space in my life for thankfulness. For, for most of us, we have a space in our lives uh, for fear. Like, fear has opened up shop in my heart. And I, 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 I pay rent on that space. I allow fear to live in that space. I feed it, I nurture it, I care for it. It's a well-lit room. Well, if I'm going to do damage to, to, to the fear of my life, if I'm going to cut, root out the fear and, and, it, and it's going to be replaced with courage, then, then I'm going to have to close shop on that space in which fear lives. I can't allow it to live there anymore. I mean, if I, if, I, if I live my life in a space dominated by social media and cable news, then fear will continue to live and thrive in my life because that's how I feed and nurture my fears. Social media, cable news, culture in general. And, and then that's how I'm creating space for fear in my life. But if I close up shop on fear, then I make a, a new space, a space in which thankfulness can reside. I, I, I abide there. I live there. I, I meditate on the goodness of God. I spend time resting in the Lord, resting in his presence, resting in his goodness. Psalm 31 says this, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you. In the sight of the children of mankind, in the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Listen, if you don't take time to, to, to be silent before the Lord and meditate on his goodness and, and rest in his presence, then your, your life will just continue to be frayed and you will continue to be dominated by fear and you will continue to ask yourself, why can't I beat this? Why can't I overcome this fear? How oh, we must stop and we must create a space in which thankfulness can reside in our hearts. Psalm 91 says, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. Many of us, these first two quadrants, many of us, we, we are allowing fear to, to, to do us harm, to seem as though it's rational when it really isn't. And many of us in the second quadrant, we're, we're, allowing, uh, we're allowing fear to reside in a space where only thankfulness should reside. We have to close up shop on one and we have to lighten up the room, make a place for thankfulness. Listen, I know there's, there are things that, that we, could, we could actually sit down and say, like, this is fearful. I and mean, we've lived through a year of fear, right? There are things about life that we could say, this could do me harm. But what if the greatest danger that resides in your life is actually your fear? What if your fear is doing you more harm than any possible risk or danger that resides in your life. This third quadrant, the last one, is this. I'm going to believe that in God's kingdom, even if I lose, I win. That, that, is, a, that is a God honoring way to live our lives. You remember King, uh, not King, the Apostle Paul, he used to th say things like, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And they'd say, oh, oh don't, don't say that, Paul. I, I'm, I'm, this is conjecture, but I'm, I, I, would, I would assume they'd say, don't say that. We don't want to hear you say that, Papa Paul. We don't, 
you know, you, you, you've been such a good church father to us, our pastor, our shepherd. We don't want you to go anywhere. You know, you've been a mentor. You've been a, a disciple, discipler. You, you're such a, don't say that. Oh, but it's true. It's true. Little children for me to live as Christ. Yes. But, but to die, that would be gain as well because I have heaven and home. We need to believe that in God's kingdom, if, you, if you're a believer, even if you lose, you win. I might die young. Um, I know I'm going to die. That's a fact. I don't know when I'm going to die. Should I not fear death? Well, I realize, like Paul says, that even if I die, I live. It's, in God's economy, even the sorrow that we experience is ultimately overcome by the joy of eternity. Jesus understands your fear, my friends. The Bible tells us that he came to this world to, to live a perfect, sinless life, to die a sinner's death, and then to walk out of the tomb having defeated sin and death for eternity. But he understands. He understands fear. He can relate to us. He has been there as well. You remember that moment in time where Jesus asked God, his heavenly Father, he asked him to deliver him from the intimidating circumstances, from, from the, the, the pain and suffering of the cross. He, for this moment in time, he asked the Lord for deliverance from that, but then he says, ultimately, your will be done. God, I, I trust, e even the stuff that seems so fearful, so dangerous, I tr you're, you're worthy of my trust, Heavenly Father. I, I'll do, you tell me to do it, and I will do it. I'll end with this. Two opposite ends of the spectrum. One is our fear. The other end of the spectrum is the love of the Lord. And, and, and I've said it, it, it's in our best interest. The Lord, he won't partner with our fear. He won't work with our fear. It's the opposite of his intention, how he works in our lives through love. 1 John 4 Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is so, also are we in this world. Therefore, I'm sorry, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. I want this for you. I want this for me, friends. I want us to be able to, to cast out fear. And the only way that that can be done is through the name and fame and work of Jesus Christ in our lives. Short of Christ in my life, there is so much for me to be fear, and it's very rational. But, but my confession in Jesus Christ, his work in my life, his work on the cross, changes all that. Rational fear becomes irrational fear. Why? Because I'm, I'm living a new life. I'm living under a new game plan, new set of rules. What used to be able to hurt me and who used to be able to hurt me, uh, they, don't have, they have no power over me anymore. I invite you today, these three steps, living in these three quadrants, those are things you can do. But ultimately, it's the power and the presence of, of Jesus working in your life that makes it all capable. Jesus wants to, great exchange, he wants to take from you your fear. He wants to replace it with his courage. I invite you to these three steps today to say, my fear is doing me harm. It's irrational. 
stuff that I've acted like fear is, 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 is helpful and somehow a, a safety valve, but it's, it's, it's a, sa- a seat belt, but it's doing me harm. I invite you to the second step, and that is taking the time, making the space, going quietly before the Lord and saying, I, wanna, I just want to rest in your goodness today. I want to celebrate your thankfulness. You've been so faithful, and you will be faithful to the end. And then this third step. I invite you to believe that, that, that even, if, even if calamity were to, were to strike your, your life, and I, I, I pray that it, that it doesn't, but even if, even if it did, that in God's kingdom, even if we lose as Christ's followers, we win. And that should give us courage, God confidence. I'm praying for you, my friend. Have a good day.